Um, what's going on, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. And yeah, we have an interview this week. Um, but I would be remiss if we didn't just like do a quick state of I'm never gonna call it the culture. Um, but just pausing as to where we are right now. Um, I'm recording this on a Sunday. Um, just after the news of the terrorist attack on um, 10 black folks in Buffalo um, who lost their lives as a result. And I don't know, like, it's just so sad because I come on here as a podcaster, as a speaker, as a thought leader, as a whatever you want to call me. But I've come on here on Living Corporate now like four or five times to like have these types of talks, like where we kind of like slow down, break regular programming and have a, a more frank conversation, more frank, frankly, <laughs> than the discussions we typically have, which is pretty frank. And I, I just don't know what to say. Right. I mean, the reality is, is that white folks by and large do not see black people as human beings. Right. Like they, they don't which is why folks are able to continue to harm black people to plan the terroristic uh, attacks on black communities and families for centuries now, to be clear, and are able to continue to plan with, frankly, with impunity right now. Yes, you can say this person was arrested, but again, like the very nature of even planning the attack and writing so loudly about it, um, the whole theory around the idea that white people are being replaced in this country Um, is parroted and championed by mainstream media outlets across the world, uh, particularly in America, that most of the people that you work with hear that type of theory and aren't immediately appalled by it. And that's many of them agree with that. And that's terrifying. And it's heartbreaking. And the implications of being able to carry such theories on such large platforms and to not challenge them or truly limit them in terms of how they are propagated directly creates harm and risk for black people. It does. It does. And that's why you also notice the same, the the Venn diagram, there's a Venn diagram of people who are really passionate about free speech and people who want to say, highly white supremacist things, highly racist, misogynistic, patriarchal things. It's damn near a circle, right? No one is really tripping about free speech like that. I I don't know. I don't know. No one's really tripping about free speech like that, except these people who want to say whatever they want as it pertains to being able to shit on black and brown people and black and brown women and women in general and disabled people and queer people, certainly black and brown, disabled and queer people. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating to hear and see. And now we're looking at these people who have passed away, who were murdered by a Twitch streamer who decided to have his real life call of duty. Modern warfare situation where he puts nigger on his assault rifle, goes into a grocery store on a Saturday and decides to take the lives of 10 innocent people. The mainstream media can't even call it what it is, which is white supremacist. They want to say racially motivated or ethnically targeted. Any language that isn't what it is. And and I'm going to tell you, the truth of the matter is, again, like the reason why we can't continue to progress and like we have yet to progress and really make any serious uh, movement on the cause of equity for black people in this country is because we're not even we, when I really mean we, I mean y'all and by y'all, I mean white folks. Y'all struggle to name things. Y'all struggle to name harm. Y'all refuse actually to name the harm of your actions for black and brown people. And I really believe that it's because you don't see it as harmful because you don't really see us as human beings. You see us really frankly, less than animals because I do believe If that white boy ran up in a grocery store and killed or ran into a pet smart and killed 10 dogs, y'all would have a problem. Somebody would have a problem. PETA would be up in arms. You white vegan activists and environmental folks, y'all would have something to say. But we're not really valuable to y'all besides as like chattel. But again, less than less than most animals. 
Because I do believe if someone killed 10 dogs on a live Twitch stream with ARF ARF on the side of the rifle, there would be laws passed. There would be protests. There would be a bunch of stuff. There would be. I'm frustrated, right? Like, I'm genuinely frustrated. I remember, actually, when I reached out to Twitch years ago, because I do a lot of engagement, like, behind the scenes. Like, I hit up brands and say, hey, like, would you like to come on the podcast? And Twitch's response at the time was that black and brown people are not a target demographic of theirs. Now, mind you, I didn't hit them up asking to get paid. I just wanted to have them on because it's tech streaming. I'm a gamer. Plenty of black folks play game. Like it was just relevant, right? Like Twitch is a huge platform. And they said, no, they said, no, again, living corporate does not reach out to pay you to be on our platform. If I reach out to you about interviewing you it's because I genuinely believe there's a valuable conversation to have. The reality is at that time, Twitch did not even see black and brown people valuable enough to like spend free time, right? To get free marketing, to talk about what they do. Like they didn't, they didn't. And that's the reality for most of these companies to be straight up with you. There's a large percentage of y'all who definitely love free, even though y'all have, y'all are, you know, multi-billion cap companies. Y'all will get free marketing, but a lot of y'all don't even care enough to like just Think about us, right? You prioritize whiteness so much so that you don't even want to like literally engage us. And guess what? Your white consumers see that and they are galvanized by that. Your white racist consumers are galvanized by that. And you know that, which is what you're trying to do. Yes, I'm saying it. How in the hell can a 18 year old feel so emboldened to go on your platform and live stream murdering people? That is insane. But guess what? That's on y'all. That's on y'all for real. That is on y'all. That is what y'all have created. That's what y'all wanted. Yes. That's what y'all wanted. I want to be, no, I'm, I want you to hear me. You wanted that. You wanted that because you don't care about black and brown people. That is the truth. That is the truth. Your actions show that. Y'all just hired a new diversity and inclusion leader, right? Yeah, I've got, I've beef with Twitch. I'm talking about y'all. Y'all just hired a diversity and inclusion leader. Y'all made sure they weren't a chief officer. You made sure they was a director. Y'all think I don't see that. I don't care how y'all gas that little roll up. They don't have power like your other senior leaders do. Cause they're not a senior, they're not a senior executive. A director is an executive role, but it's like a junior executive role. It's not the same amount of power, responsibility or, or anything like that. Right. And y'all know that. And I bet you, if we were to look at the org chart, I bet you they report to the HR, HR office too. I bet you they don't report to the CEO either. I'm sick of y'all. I'm genuinely sick of y'all. Right. It doesn't matter. Like there's so much disgusting pain and trauma that black and brown people are subjected to every single day. We're not safe anywhere. I'm recording this while I'm trying to plan a grocery trip right now with my wife and my daughter trying to figure out, okay, I guess I'm going to go. We're going to just pick it up outside. We're not going in nowhere. Okay. We're just not going to eat that this week because we have to go in to get that. So we're going to change our whole style. This community was super segregated, right? Y'all are like, it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous the way that we are treated in this country. Don't ask us for nothing. Like my prayers and my thoughts are genuinely with everybody that looks like me that has to work this week. And also those who are not privileged enough to call out black who have to go into the office, right? Cause that's another thing. Y'all want us to go into the office. My God, I'm so thankful that my job allows me to work remotely. I am so glad this is not an ad. This is not even an ad for my, for my job. I'm so glad that I'm privileged. And I don't have to walk in somewhere. When people ask me, oh, Zach, do you want to go back? No, I don't. This is why. I cannot imagine having to go back into the office after this weekend and sit down and talk to you about your Cocker Spaniel or the baseball game or the draft or the play. I don't want to talk to none of y'all about nothing. The mental health impacts on this alone are just 
incalculable America. Y'all do a great job of tracking and monitoring rappers who have a whole bunch of weed on them and y'all want to get them in, caught up in RICO cases. And yet there's gunmen all over the place actively trying to kill us. Actively trying to kill us. And I'm reporting this live. I'm looking at this like I'm learning this in real time. A gunman entered True Bethel Baptist Church in Buffalo this morning. He was stopped in the lobby before he could enter the sanctuary. Several officials, including the New York governor, were attending the worship service. This is from Rolling Out. I'll put the link in the show notes. There are complex, coordinated systems of terrorism happening for black people every single day. And you want me to sit here and think that those same systems that are so pervasive outside the workplace don't seep in and leak in the workplace? You really want me to not believe that black and brown people at work are not systemically targeted and harmed and exploited and marginalized and otherized and isolated? Really? You want me to assume positive intent? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Peak frustrating. And I just, I don't know what else to say or do at this point. It's interesting how, again, like the media machines We've pivoted away from caring about black people, right? So, you know, this hasn't made, you know, national news in the same way. And, you know, I doubt that we're going to see the same level of protest and all all those. I I just doubt it. I doubt it because uh, white America is fatigued of talking about race, despite y'all continuing to y'all continue to make things about race. Y'all decided to segregate this community and create a food desert and create systems and things in place where this is the only grocery store in many miles for this very isolated black community. That was systems and stuff that y'all made. Black people didn't do that. White people did. Right? Now, if you're listening to this and you're like, man, Zach, are you talking about me? If you think I'm talking about you, yeah, I guess I'm talking about you. Clearly, I'm talking about the systems. I'm talking about these systems in place that perpetuate harm and oppression for people that look like me. Some of these people that were murdered by this boy were my grandparents' age. Literally my grandparents' age. Gosh. Y'all got to stop thinking that work and the world are separated. They are not. They are not. The same people that are on 4chan and Reddit and Twitch and Facebook and Twitter and wherever else talking about white replacement theory are the same people managing black and brown employees every day. The same people who interview and say, ah, they're not a culture fit. The same people who are responsible for processes and procedures in workplaces that make black and brown folks jobs harder. The same people that don't want to respond to your Slack messages or your emails. The same people that can't participate and support workplace energy. These are the same people. Those people have jobs too. Those people work places. I needed to come on here because I wanted to make this statement. Like we have a show for you this week. I'm consistently thankful for the shows that we are able to have, the guests that we're able to have. And I'm not going to apologize for ranting. I'm not. I'm not. Because I am, I am at my end when it comes to anti-black violence. I'm at my end when it comes to systems in and outside of the workplace. Again, they're not separate. There is no dividing line that are coordinated to harm and disenfranchised black people. I'm at my end. I'm at my wits end about it. I don't have a bunch of like smooth jokes. You saw, I didn't come in here um, talking low. I'm upset. I'm upset. But I'm going to tell you something leaders. If you're listening to this right now, you need to understand that your black, fo- your black folks, your black employees, they're upset too. They're upset. And I promise you, if they had a choice, they wouldn't be at work right now, but they got to be so they can take care of their families so they can figure out how to go to the grocery store, but also not get murdered at the grocery store. So they can figure out how to drive the grocery store and not get killed by the police. For real. We're not safe anywhere. Like, don't even get me started on when we actually get to work and y'all have inequitable performance processes. So when I'm at my job, you still on my back for no reason. You're on my bumper for nothing. I'm seeing my white colleagues over there doing whatever they want to do. But you on my bumper asking me about every little thing. Like, don't get me started, man. Like, this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Diversity inclusion leaders, man, I, I, I feel for some of y'all because there's a lot of y'all in these positions where y'all definitely want to be doing the right things. Or you're really not empowered. But some of y'all are in positions and y'all could be doing more, but y'all choose not to because you're scared about losing the bag. OK, and if you're that scared to lose a bag where you're not going to you're not willing to speak up for black and brown people at your jobs that are being harmed, you need to sit down, move around, go do something else. Go do anything else. For real. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You HR leaders. As you go into your week, think about your black employees. And before you write up some pithy email 
Review your organizational policies and figure out what can we do so that a workplace can be a bit of an oasis from the desert of oppression that these people face every day in the country that we live. Ask yourself that. Ask yourself how you could do that. CEO, COOs, listen to your black employees. Listen to them. And or if you don't care, say loudly that you don't care. But all these little goofy, stupid programs where you pat black folks on the head and tell them to just work harder or say that you care or give some multi-year players who don't do anything. Stop all of that. Okay. There's enough resources out there now. There's plenty of consulting firms out there right now. Black owned consulting firms you can reach out to who will tell you, give you meaningful action. Spend the money on that. Spend the money on that. All right. That's it. Um, we're going to go ahead and get to the show, but I, I just would be remiss, like I said, to not speak on what I'm seeing around. Like, we didn't even talk about these draconian laws. Folks are trying to make abortion illegal. Again, like, that ties into white replacement theory. That's a whole nother conversation that we will get to, but I'm going to have a black woman on the show specifically to talk about that because I want to make sure that I platform experts in this space who can speak to that in a meaningful impactful way but we will be talking about that like you need to know that we're going to talk about that too i'm not sleep at all we're going to go ahead and tap in with tristan and after that we'll get to the interview that we had i love y'all peace what's going on living corporate it's tristan of layfield resume consulting and i've teamed up with living corporate to bring you all a weekly career tip this week i want to talk to you about the importance of reflecting on your career Today, I participated in a LinkedIn Live where the topic was change, specifically taking change by the horns. We discuss many things surrounding change, including a big career transition that I'm going to be making. But one of the things that we discussed was career changes and knowing the transferable skills to get you to the job that you want. Now, when I talk to many of my clients, I find that that's the exact issue that they have. They don't understand the transferable skills that they possess to get them to the job that they want. And I've been sitting and thinking about why that is. And I've come to the conclusion that it's because many of us are not necessarily reflecting on our career and the experiences that we've had. We're so in the throes of our day-to-day job that we don't tend to keep track of the things that we've done or experienced or the results we've driven. But unfortunately, if you're looking to make some major career changes, that information is so essential. So I know you're probably like, well, okay, what can I do with that? Well, I tell people, if you know what job you want to get, start reading job descriptions and then directly following that, read your resume to reflect over the experiences that you have inside of it. But also start thinking about the experiences that you may not be listing that align with what you read in that job description. You don't want to just think about achievements and awards, but you want to think about projects you were involved in and how you created results there. You want to think about ideas or strategies you recommended that somebody may somebody else may have implemented. You also want to think about things like trainings or involvements in employees resource groups or anything that's going to help you connect the dots so you can paint the picture of why you're the best candidate for that job. Now, After reflecting, if you can't relate anything in your experience to where you want to go, you probably need to identify opportunities that can provide you with those experiences. You can do that by talking to your manager or networking in the office to get an idea of ongoing or upcoming projects that you might be able to volunteer for and gain those experiences. Once you take the time to reflect on your career, I can guarantee you're going to start identifying things that relate to where you want to go, and those are going to be the things that help sell you as that best candidate. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. You can connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn, or you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Layfield Resume. Amani, welcome to the show. How you doing? I'm good, thank you. Listen, um, first of all, let me just say, I so very much so appreciate um, who you are, who you present yourself to be on your socials, your brand, like super critical and important. Um, you highlight the tr- the intersection of so many different identities and experiences. Um, and I'll say this, and I've said this several times on Living Corporate is, you know, we've had Melissa Thompson, 
Um, we've had a couple other folks. Um, we don't for for a platform that really espouses itself on centering and amplifying marginalized folks at work. We we have under engaged um, disabled experiences, um, especially at the intersection of disability and work. Um, I think that you know you've talked about this at length, and I can't wait to give you the floor to really to kind of like unpack it a bit more. Um, you've spoken at length about this uh, panoramic, this Pangea, this Pythagoras, Panini, yeah. this Panini, this. Uh, mm-hmm plagiarism um and its impact its impact on um on how we even view disability and really how th- the confluence of events between um you know people say a reckoning it hasn't been a racial reckoning but you know like this globe all these global protests against white supremacy or what folks are framing as white supremacy um or people people limited people people have limited understanding of white supremacy um the us being like late stage capitalism and like you know, uh, the inf- economy, uh, the housing market and the supply chain and the great resignation, all these things coming together, I think have really created like this, this, um, this environment where like a lot of things are kind of bubbling up to the top, but we'll get there. I'm gonna take my time. Cause I'm, I'm excited to have you here. So first <laughs> off, thank you. no, thank you. So, so first off, like, you know, you've built this incredible brand, um, through social media and your writing, you've been featured all over the place. You've written for Vice and um, you know and Verizon and Bustle and Forbes, Insider. You know, talk to me about like the. Let's just start with. I'm gonna give you a hard question. Let's just start with like, what is it like to 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 exist in so many multiple spaces, like out loud and so purposely? Like, I think it's interesting. Like, you know, for I think it's, first of all, like disability is broad like there's visible and and, yeah. and invisible disability i think like i think also like diversity is you know mm-hmm. is also like a you know is a broad term of white folks kind of made it up but it's like you know when you're visibly diverse right so you're you're black you're yeah. a woman yeah you're disabled like yeah. talk to me about like what is it what does it mean to exist simultaneously and and i just named three things I, i'm confident that you are dozens of other things um, <laughs> yeah but, but 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 like talk to me about what it means to just to, to to exist simultaneously in all these identities in this world um it's rough but also very freeing in a certain sense i remember like from a very young age you know i when I was growing up, I was very much so trying to separate myself out so that other people felt more comfortable around me. Um, and I was just like, you know, like what, after a while, I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I trying to make pe- other people comfortable around me? And I think that that realization was like, ah, fuck it. Like, I'm just gonna like, I'm just gonna do what I need to do. Um, because there's no, there's nothing I can actually achieve or accomplish that'll make people see me as anything, anything different than what, from what they want to see me as. Um, and as a black disabled woman, like the amount of times um, people feel really entitled to my personhood in so many different ways. Um, and people are feel entitled to my labor. They feel entitled to my story. They feel entitled to know what's wrong with me, to know um, what my disability is, to know my medical history, just complete strangers. Um, so I've always lived my life in such a way that um, I was under a microscope and under people's gaze all the time so when it came to social media I was like people are like well people are gonna see, you're gonna be more exposed your people are gonna see you for you and I'm like well listen people have been staring at me my entire life what is the difference I'm just giving them a reason to now so yeah it's it's an interesting kind of dynamic let's talk a little bit about that word entitlement like let's unpack that a bit when you say people feel like people are entitled to you um yeah give me give me some examples of what you mean by that and how does that play out so when I was growing up, I've had people grab at me um, because they wanted a hug. I've had people kiss me on the street as a child because they thought I was so inspiring. I've had people um, grab at my crutches to get my attention. Um, those are the interpersonal things. And there's the, you know, online of why aren't you talking about A, B, or C topic? And I'm like, because I heard about it two seconds ago when you mentioned. I don't know. Like, um, also, don't, like also, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, also don't have to. Right. Like, I also don't have to. I, and I, I'm learning that more and more so now that I don't always have to speak on everything. Um, but I take very, very much. I take a lot of care in deciding what I do and do not want to talk on. And it's not necessarily because I don't care. It's because I may not just have the range, you know, and people always want black women, especially to overextend ourselves and perform for them. 
Um, when in reality, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm done. I'm tired. <laughs> you know. There's something so exotic. Now, look, I'm a uh, able-bodied, straight black man, so you know, I I would not pres- I presume to have to be in the same level of I rec- I presented I pr- participate in a variety of privileges, right, and systems, mm-hmm. knowingly and unknowingly, uh, but still, and, and at varying degrees, just by the nature mm-hmm. of you know, how I show up in the world. But I will say that, like, there is a reality. I, I can relate to this pressure to speak on things and or just perform. And it's like, look, I, you know, this is not like, a sh- this is not theater to me. But so much yeah. of, like, this space today, like, and I, I'll say, like, since the murder of George Floyd specifically, and I'm sure there's been, I'm sure it's, I know it's wax and wane. I just haven't been on the earth long enough to, to say that for sure. But I'm sure that, you know, there's like, we're in the season right now where, like, everybody is, like, trying to have a position on everything, yeah. And there's a pressure and frankly, there's economic incentive, there's financial incentive to be a black or brown face, like saying stuff about stuff to like audiences that are like really willing to like be entertained. You know what I'm saying? So like, I guess to that end, like, what does it look like for you to to really continue to step into your own voice and speak about the things that are relevant for you? And how do you choose those things? First and foremost, I work in communications. I just think it's a bad idea. Like just from a communication standpoint to force people to speak on everything. It's basically like I said, like a like I said before, which is a large game of whisper down the lane. And you have the initial Im- message and then you have everybody else along the lane. It it'll get muddled, it, it'll get rebranded, it'll get repackaged. So there's no reason for for people to be asking everybody to speak on everything. It's just not sustainable. Um, but in terms of what I decided to speak on, I realized that there are other people already speaking on a multitude of things. Like wherever I can, I try to boost the voices of other people who are not me, who are in different marginalizations, who have other perspectives on things, because that's not my experience. And it's not my experience to always speak on. Um, and I always feel out of place whenever I'm forced to speak on something that I don't have a knowledge base for. Like, I just don't, I just don't know. I'm still learning about a lot of things like other people are. And the fact that we don't give people enough grace to understand, like, there's a difference between not knowing because they don't care and not knowing because they know what they don't know um, and are humble enough to admit when they don't know something. Um, and so I try to speak on things that are specific to the disability community, to black folks, um, to the mix of disabled and black folks, to disabled people of color, and to address, like, white supremacy within the disability community as well as white supremacy, um, how, how white supremacy utilizes the disability community. And so I try to stick within that lane. And also, um, I'm trying to talk more about like my expertise and the things I'm passionate about, because I think we advocate for so long it's so hard to be a part of the room that we forget why we wanted to be there in the first place. So you said um, it's interesting, you know, I, you were you had this TikTok like a couple, maybe it's like a month ago. I don't know. Time time is moving like in this uh, Jeremy bear me. It's weird. Uh, but. <laughs> But, like, you were talking about this idea of, like, allyship and, like, Mm -hmm. questioning, like, the merits of it. Like, what are your thoughts on allyship conceptually? And, like, what's been your experience when it comes to allyship as a, like, as, as a Black disabled woman, like, navigating these spaces? Like, like I'm, I'm just really curious to get, like, your perspective on that. And then, um... And what is and 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 if you agree, if you believe that allyship is, is real, then like what does real allyship look like? Yeah, I always I'm always questioning whenever I see somebody put create like a trademark or a brand to something that is really necessary for human community. Um, like creating an like allyship was never really like a term or like a huge big branded idea prior to maybe like the 2015, like 2015, 2010, like that type of era. Um, and we've created this entire identity around being an ally that is just basically calling somebody a good person. Um, like that there has to be like a brand name to this that isn't really necessary. Um, and I, I did that TikTok because I was like, I really dislike the idea of people calling themselves ally to other communities that are marginalized because that's not really a thing. Um, I, f- I think that if that community feels like you've done enough or that you are educated enough or that you are um, in the paint with them for them for so long that, you know, they don't question your motives, they don't question your ideals, um, then they can call you ally. But you should never be calling yourself an ally. I don't get that. Um, 
it's it's very weird like it's it's like it's very strange because you know um as a black disabled woman there are people who will consider themselves my ally along the, the lines of race and then we'll completely forget about the disability aspect to it but not realizing that disability is utilized to marginalize people racially and then they'll be shooting themselves in the foot with their advocacy or their allyship and they'll be they'll just be I don't know. I I really struggle with thinking people can be allies. I really struggle with people describing themselves as allies. It's not necessarily that people cannot be accomplices or cannot be really good people or cannot be invested in the in the liberation of us all, but the fact that we need to put a name to it and that you don't need to earn that name, you could just ascribe it to yourself. That's that's going to always be weird to me. I'm going to tell you too like when I was just talking to who was I talking to? I'm not going to name drop like people. Yeah, no. I'm, that's messy. I'm not, that's tacky. But I was, but I was just talking to somebody like we just had an interview with Living Corporate like some time ago. And I was like, I hate it when people do that. And like, it's always white men um, telling me I'm your ally. So white women, too. But I feel like yeah. white women have a little bit more like a smidgen more, a little like just a little bit more self-aware it's a little bit more self-awareness mm, and so not maybe, much not, like like not talking about not like a, a whole lot like a like a like a, like a, smith, like, a, like, a crumb, like a crumb like a crumb more <laughs> <laughs> very little more so smidget more but like no but they'll be like i'm your ally and i'm like man like it's wild you saying that can you get can you like donate ten thousand dollars to live in corporate can you like put some like show me something tangible like you have all these resources like can you like connect me to some can you Oh, you just want you just want me to pat you on the back. Like that's weird. Like it's weird. It's weird. It's we- and you could always tell them like you could always tell the type of person they are, but what at the moment in which they tell you they're an ally. Yeah. Right? Because uh, well like for instance, like black women will be saying something like, Listen, I am really tired of the massage noir. Like, um, you know, I get it from all sides, from white women, from black men, from society at large, all these different things. And white women will say, But I'm your ally. It's like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> you know, does that distract from what I just said? No. And so when the moment when they bring it up is always really telling, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Well, okay. well, well, it's what? Well, well, okay, so I'm not gonna say the person, but this per they made me kind of mad because they so they 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 hit they saw me. I was doing a Twitter Spaces. They hit me up and mm-hmm. they were like, hey, I'd love to like just chat with you. Like I heard the end of your Twitter Spaces. Just want to connect, and I have a Calendly that I don't make public, but I had a Calendly. I was like, go ahead and five fifteen. Now again, I looked at this person. This person got a verified check, and you know, Imani, look, I'm still, I'm, I'm niggerish. So I saw a verified check. I said, oh, hey, maybe you got a little something. Maybe you got a little. Maybe, I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna leave with something. Maybe I'm gonna leave with something. I don't know. We'll <laughs> I see. I'm not much, but I'm gonna leave with something. I'm gonna leave with something. I don't know. But, but so, but so, so we get on the phone and like we're talking, and they're like, yeah, you know, I'm an ally. I'm your ally. So like, just let me, you know. And then like, as soon as they said that. Like the next words were, and if you ever need me to come on Living Corporate and like just kind of talk, and I have that perspective, and I was like, Oh no, oh, I don't man. like all that. I don't, I don't like. I don't like that. I don't like that. Because like, what do you know? Like, like, hold on. How did the? How are you? How are you saying? How do you start off with you're my ally, but then the next statement is me giving you space for you. Yeah. You're, that like come on like that's and that seems so so much of what this seems to be about is like. I guess going back to your whole point around just like entitled to you and your space is like just folks just want you to sh- they want you to give them th- I'm like yo like I've I'm be honest I feel like I'm giving a lot I feel like you know yeah to, maybe you maybe you give something so right. um so let's let's talk a little bit about you know your commentary on disability again like in this new working context like I would just love to give you space like talk to me about like what you're seeing in this new work from home dynamic Mm -hmm. um, and this pressure that organizations are creating to encourage employees to go back, excuse me, return back to the office. Well, okay. So let's start with the beginning of the pandemic because I feel like I have to start at the beginning. Um, Right as the pandemic started, everything became accessible just as they left disabled people to die, which is like insulting in and of itself. Um, It became accessible. and things became available that disabled people have been asking for this entire time. We've been asking for remote work. We've been asking for remote telemedicine. We've been asking for 
all of these different services to be available to us. And people are like, nah, it's not possible. It's not available. Um, and then two years later, people are like, oh, I love this. I'm so used to this. I don't want to return to the office. Um, and disabled people are like, well, yeah, that's the whole, that's why we, hello, we've been talking about this for years, for decades. Um, and I think that remote work is, is our future. There is no going back to normal. I, I really dislike this idea that people are trying to pressure us or push this narrative forward that that is even possible. It's not even, it's not even remotely possible. Um, just the things that have been revealed to us during the pandemic is in and of itself an indication that we can't go back to a normal that we were used to. Um, as it pertains to work, I think people are more, I think people are better advocates for themselves. I think they're really realizing what they want out of their lives and they want balance. I think that that's the, biggest takeaway that we have in terms of work and the pandemic, a lot of employers just did not give a crap. They just did not care for their employer, for employees. Um, and people started realizing that their health is actually in the hands of their employer. Um, and it's not just with the pandemic. Which is it's with terrifying. The fact, right. Like, if the, like the fact that your healthcare is tied to employment, that in and of itself is a problem enough. Um, but the fact that employers are making policies of people being in the office during um, high transmission rates and people um, and people not wearing masks and like I don't want to wear a mask because it reminds me of the pandemic. Who cares if it reminds you of the pandemic? It's safer. Um, and people really saw like their employers show their true colors and they were like, no, no, I'm not gonna let you control my life in this way. I'm not gonna let you to have this amount of power over me. I want to have spend time with my family. I want time for the, my passions. I want time to have fun. I no longer want to work this grind. And so the great resignation was, it was always going to happen. Like it was always going to happen when you put that amount of power in um, one person's hand or in one employer's hand, there was always going to be a breaking point in which people said to pe said to their employers, I'm done. Um, so the great resignation makes perfect sense to me. Um, and when you consider too that, you know, disability also plays a role, um, watching disabled people struggle for employment through this, through for years, like when I would apply for jobs and disclose that I had a disability, I would never get an interview. I would apply for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of jobs and never get a single interview. Once I stopped disclosing, I got like six interviews in a week. And like wow. these are federal, yeah, these are federal forms that where they're supposed to be saying, oh, you know, uh, it's it we don't use this against you in terms of employing you. It's like that's bullshit. Um, but anyways, people, disabled people are now everybody else's competition because the remote work that we've been asking for, we now have access to because of the pandemic. Um, and now they want to take it away because I think there's also the fact that there's, uh, you know, commercial real estate, but also there's a ton of like nepotism hires that are basically middlemen that are not necessary that just realize like, right. hey, if I'm not actually in the office, people don't actually I don't have any value. need me, right? Like they don't actually need me around. Um, yeah, so I think that there's there, this was always going to happen. This we were always going to get to this place. You know, it's interesting because I, so I'm coming for, I'm coming from consulting where you know, and for folks who don't know, listening in, it's like you know, consulting is just you just like fly from like you fly in on a Sunday night or early Monday morning, and you just sit in like a dark room in New Jersey or wherever their client side is. And you just yeah. do a bunch of work that you could have done at home. You know yeah. what I mean? That's, you're not, it's not, you're not like, you're not like a, like, I'm not like a, like a playground consultant or like where I'm like, yo, you gotta, let me test these monkey. But like, I'm not doing that. I'm just like, <laughs> making, I'm just making some PowerPoint slides. It's not. And so like, I remember this was like four or five years ago. Like, like I've since exited consulting, but like this was years ago. And I would just be like, I remember like I, I went, I was in a, on a client site in new jersey and i remember i was just like this is a, this is a sham like why are we doing this like why why do i have to be in the office like why do i have to be somewhere physically for this right like it's giving overseer vibes like why yes do I, is it not yeah. like why like i don't have to be i don't have to physically be here for this and like you know there's just so you know like there are jobs now like don't get me wrong like there are jobs that you have to be there in person right yeah like, like, and I, I understand that. And I'm not arguing the, that I am also saying it is the year of our Beyonce 2022. Like <laughs> there's a lot of things that like we can, we can optimize through tech. 
Like we don't have to be in person to have a meeting. And frankly, you know, all these studies have been coming out. It's interesting too, like how some of these studies be. So I've seen certain studies that are like, Hey, black and brown people have really been appreciated not having to be in the office. Cause I'll oh, yeah. you with you racist people. Cause y'all don't know how to act. Y'all be all the gaslighting and microaggressions. They can kind of opt out. They don't have to be on camera. They don't have to even, sh- they can just kind of like, they can yeah. self, they can sell, they can pace themselves as opposed to kind of being, you know, hit it with an onslaught of your ignorance um, mm-hmm. 20, for, for eight straight hours or 10 hours or whatever. Then I see the other little studies. It's like, oh, well, you know, you're missing out on critical development and networking. And it's like Work culture. And I'm like, yeah. ah, cause like, <laughs> cause how often do black, like how often do historically marginalized people even benefit from that stuff anyway? Like I see, I wake up every day and I'm me. So I know that and most like most of the time they're teaching you stuff that black people and brown people know inherently. Like, how do we form a good community? I mean, hello. <laughs> Come on. Come on. That's right. the other thing too. It's like, it's like, okay, I mean, also organizations could just try harder. Like, try yeah. harder. Like make like be creative. Like think about other ways to build connection and mentorship and stuff. Like, you know, those things don't just happen. And some people are like, well, you know, those things just happen when you're in the office. Like, that's not really true. Like it takes labor and effort to create these experiences. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about like, even just like when you talked about the, like, even with benefits and insurance and stuff like that, like you've said this a couple times. I'm like, every time you said, like you talked about like how like eyeglasses are a disability, mm-hmm. but it's just that it's a lot of people, like millions of people need glasses so we've normalized that can you talk a little bit more about like the normalization of certain disabilities um, and the stigmatization um, or otherization of others yeah so what you're referring to is what's what we like to call um the social versus like the medical model of disability um so basically what i refer to when i say people have glasses and that's a disability is that you have vision impairment which is uh not necessarily fixed but helped by eyeglasses right um, but and it's so destigmatized that you feel like, hey, I can go about life or go about work and my glasses are not necessarily an issue. Um, basically, what that means is like we're, we're making sure that you have the accommodations or that you have access to the accommodations that you need to go about your day. Um, and basically, the social model with disability says that. Excuse me, whatever diagnosis that you have. Is one issue, but we as a society built in an inaccessibility to keep people out of public space to keep people out of the workforce. And we need to do better to build an inclusive society that is available to everybody. And so that's kind of what I was talking about. We need to do more to build a society where accommodations are not exceptional, they are the norm. That we have a culture of accessibility from the ground up rather than trying to fit in the last little bits of pieces um, of accessibility at the end point at which it's not really feasible anymore. Um, We need to build in disabilities, disability inclusion um so that disabled people aren't stigmatized for needing what we need um and that's why disabled people don't like the term special needs or disability Mm. like it's a disability like i live in a disabling society i have a disability Mm. um and you are actively contributing to my disabling by not building a society that is inclusive for us all Mm. um yeah there's something that's profound because it's i mean it's kind of reminds me of like well, no. So it's it's interesting because you're saying when you say we, we live in a disabling society. So like this idea of disability is more much more so, if not wholly upon the environment which drives disability rather than the individual as if the individual in some way is lacking or um, has failed in some way. Yeah. So our entire system of policy is built around what's called the individual model of disability, as well as the medical model of disability. The mm-hmm. individual model says that disability is an individual problem to be com- overcome by the individual. There is no need for public funds or accessibility or for society to change at all. It is mm-hmm. the individual's problem having a disability and they need to fix it. Now, the medical model says that that can be done through medical intervention, solely through physical therapies, through all of these different toolkits that are medically uh, prescribed. Um, and I don't think disabled people um, believe that it is wholly one or the other. I think a lot okay. of us do recognize, like, I have I have chronic pain. That's not going to go away by there being a ramp. But it was it's made better by me having access to a ramp. It's, I don't okay. think it's one or the other. It's more like 
we want as many tools as possible in our in our toolkit so we can live the lives that we choose to live. The challenge, though, like to your point, like the challenge is always like culturally we do have we're in a very I mean, it's also part of like just like uh, white supremacy and like patriarchies. We have this event. We have a very individualistic culture, right? Like we don't really embrace community in any real way. Like we struggle with collaboration, uh, let alone community. So like I hear you. Um, you know, let, let me ask you this, you know, as, as we as we think about like accessibility and the future of work and like um and and disability, um, it's interesting. We had Felissa Thompson on some years some in a little while ago, like just some years ago. Um, and she was talking about the 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 white supremacy prevalent in the disabled community and the lack of and and I'm gonna say I don't this is gonna sound so privileged. It boggles it boggles my mind and it's disappointing that whiteness is so pervasive that one would that there would be oppression uh in that space. And again, I'm not I, I, I speak I'm I'm owning my ignorance and owning my privilege like and I, and I, and I, of course, I believe, I believe Alyssa when she said it, like I didn't question it. It just blows. And I'm embarrassed to say it blows my mind. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Like the dynamic of race, the intersection of race in, in the disabled community. I'm chuckling because I always get like in trouble whenever I talk about it, but um, I don't care. <laughs> um, okay. is, um, yeah. So disability for decades has been represented as a white issue. Mm. Um, and we have, we have shaped entire policies, um, diagnoses even, um, in our society to accommodate white disabled people first and everybody else. Well, that's just their nature, right? Um, the groups with the highest rates of disability are indigenous folks and black folks. Um, yet we're very rarely represented even within our own communities as, as having a disability. Um, but white supremacy is, is an extremely huge problem within the disability community. But you have to understand, too, our society, a lot of our accommodations are built around capitalism and white supremacy. Um, they tell, like, I've been in programs since I was two years old, and they hammer into you. If you have a job, you'll be valuable, you'll be successful, you'll be valued. Um, if you have, if you build capital, then nobody could tell you that you're actually disabled. You're not actually disabled if you can carry a job and all these different things. Um, and then you think about the interpersonal bigotry and racism and things like that, that play a role in pe people's ability to get a job, to be able to provide for themselves. And it's all very like interconnected, interwoven. Um, and white disabled people benefit the most. You know, our welfare system was designed for white people. Our charitable system, um, I was some while ago, I think I was at like a nonprofit convention and I was listening to the speaker speak and say that they they run a nonprofit and when they said and then when they put black people as those being the beneficiaries of their charity, they got way less donations than if they put white people. Like this is like this is very well known, like you put white people first. And even with my own organization, the first thing I did, I'm a communication director. The very first thing I did was, I was like, I'm gonna switch up some of these photos. We're gonna get some more we're gonna get some more color in here. Um, but people really do and not. You talk about you talk about crutches and spice, right? Oh no, th this is my my full time job, my other job. I'm a communication director. Yeah. So I was like, I was like, and they were like receptive to. It. They're like, yeah, absolutely. Let's change it up. Let's make things more diverse. But like I said, it's a very much a white thing. Um, there are entire groups of particularly white disabled people on Reddit that will harass and dox and try to get black and brown disabled people kicked off of their benefits. There are white supremacists with disabilities. Um, there, the, the, I don't know if you've heard of 8chan as it pertains to, you know, the QAnon conspiracy started by a white disabled man. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, all, like it's all up and through it. Um, uh, it's a big problem in our community and a lot of people are not really wanting to address it because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable that the exact same dynamics of the rest of society are also mirrored within the disability community. Um, yeah, I mean, I've heard of black disabled people who use service animals um, being accused of stealing those animals or stealing um, the stealing the service animals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Having the cops called on them. Um, yeah, it's a it's different being black and disabled than just being disabled. Um, I've been asked if I gotten shot. Um, 
and that's why I'm disabled. Uh, Ma'am. I'm serious. I was, I was, and I promised I was minding my own business. Like I was, just, I was just sitting there, and this white woman look, looks at me, looks at my one of my scars. I have a scar on my um, calf that kind of looks puckered because when I was little, it was infected and it got scarred really bad. Um, and she goes, "Oh, did you get shot?" I was Ma'am. like, "No." Can I just have the paperwork I came down here for? And then like, I'll just. So to your point about like people having to deal with microaggressions. The only thing that has been good about the pandemic is I haven't had to deal with non-disabled people that much. Um, yeah. I just, I don't have a lot to say. I'm just shocked. <laughs> I'm just, I am genuinely, I am, what's the, I am, what's the word? Your I, am, I am gobsmacked. I am genuinely <laughs> aghast at what you're saying. And yeah. dang, why this is crazy. White folks, why, what's wrong? What's going on? Like, this white supremacy is a scourge. It's a scourge. It needs to be. It, this yeah. Is, this is this is this is actually. I mean, now I've known it's been out of control, but I think it's just hearing it from another person. This is out of control. That is absolutely crazy. Um, oh yeah, and oh, I was actually so I was actually researching a video yesterday. It's funny you brought this up. So people think people seem to believe that disabled people overwhelmingly vote um, Democrat or progressive policies. But I think the the it's a lot closer than you think. Like uh, I would think about like 42 to 45 percent of disabled people voted conservative, um, both in 2016 and in 2020. GOP so don't care about y'all. I mean, but here's the thing, though. Here's like here's what disability advocacy told me. So I work for an organization that does a lot of political lobbying, that does a lot of advocacy on the political level. The people taking meetings from disabled people are not always who you think they are. And the people canceling on disabled people are not always who you think they are. Really? I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. I'm trying to figure out what we're going to title this episode. You you get <laughs> all kinds of tea. This is incredible. Okay. So, right. Okay. Well, let's. Okay. You know what? Look, this is, uh, we ain't owned by no uh, um, uh, media outlet. So let me ask. When you say that, what you trying to say? You saying that the GOP will take the meetings and then like these like liberals these democrats won't some on the state level yeah that's wild <laughs> yeah yeah it's real bad like it's, that's that's and, really that's really wild oh yeah so like i don't know um so i'm pro choice right mm-hmm. and what a lot of people do not realize is that people always have this stereotype like i don't want any disabled people shaping policy or disabled people who are mentally disabled shaping policy because they don't know what they're doing like there's always like this stereotype right Mentally, I don't. Okay, keep going, keep going. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping up. So, advocates with Down syndrome are some of the most impactful advocates on abortion restrictions in the country. And to like, and and this what? is like, <laughs> this yes, is like, this is like, you know, I'm gonna tell you this straight up. Since you started talking about white supremacy in the disabled community, this feels like I'm watching a shocking TikTok. It's like it feels like I'm just watching <laughs> shocking TikToks back to back. What? Uh, Say that again. Yeah. So they have some of the most imp- da- advocates with Down syndrome have some of the most impactful advocacy surrounding abortion legislation, and to their cre- like they have a lot more power than people give them credit for. They uh, they have an entire lobbying arm, um, and because people on the left keep saying that the re- the greatest reason to have abortion access is in case you have a disabled child. What if you have a child with? Yeah, it's that's wild ableist. I didn't I didn't I didn't I didn't, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. People have commented on the most random videos. Oh, I'd rather have a dead child than a disabled child of mine. And I'm like literally sitting there like it was on a video of me singing. That was the one that pissed me off the most. I was literally just singing to like a TikTok sound. And people were like, oh, I'd rather. Yeah. So people keep saying that. And I keep telling them you have to stop saying that there are people taking advantage of this narrative. It's not going to go the way you think it's going to go. Yeah. So there are certain advocates that have advocated for the restriction of abortions on the basis of disability. Uh, also, this disability is part of the reason why we do not have a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Mm, keep going. So, uh, I don't know if you know this, but in thirty eight states, it's legal to pay disabled people below the minimum wage. I did not know that. Yeah, it's called fourteen C legislation, and it's coupled with the tipping industry. And so, for the most part, for the most successful bills to increase the minimum wage, it has been coupled with 
raising the minimum wage and then also eradicating 14C legislation or subminimum wage for disabled people. Those two are usually paired together. So when we see these companies, like these local businesses, and they'll be like, like all the employees be disabled. That's like a money play? Sometimes. It depends on, like, you have to really look at it. There's actually a registry of 14C organizations. There's several um, there's several goodwills that pay disabled people below the minimum wage. The Oscars uh, contracted with a company that paid disabled people below the minimum wage in 2019. They were sued. The company was sued over it. Um, but here's the, here's the rub. So remember when, I don't know if you know this, but in addition to disabled people being paid below the minimum wage, a lot of our services in healthcare is income-based. So parents of disabled people who are on services and Medicaid and Med- and cannot extend that income, advocate against the minimum wage increase because if they make too much money, they'll lose their health care. So their entire advocacy groups that surround keeping the minimum wage where it is because otherwise their relatives, their family members, the people that, who they're advocating for will lose their health care, lose services, lose access to programs for disabled people that are income-based. Wow. And th- and those and those two pieces of legislation are usually almost always paired together. So they'll strike down the entire law because it doesn't necessarily take into account the needs of disabled people. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, first of all, let me just say thank you for being of a course. guest on Living Corporate. Of course. Two. It's obvious we're gonna have to have you back for a part two because this is. I that. I'm speechless. I will say, and let me ask you this. <laughs> I'm not gonna say nothing else. I'm gonna ask you this. Let me go wrap up. Is <laughs> talk to me about <laughs> talk to me about your inspirations, right? Like you know, I feel like do you have any people that you look up to in the like in the activist space in the advocacy accessibility space? You know, who people here who are still with us, people who have passed on, like. I'm curious, like who, like who inspires you? Yeah, I really am inspired by like the Black disabled folks that like history kind of erased their disabilities. Mm. Um, you know, Audre Lorde was a disabled Black woman. Brad Lomax was a Black Panther and a disability advocate. Uh, Harriet Tubman was disabled, had you know fainting spells and narcolepsy and all these different things. And I just urge people to see disabled Black people as whole people. Um, and disability does not take away from anything that they've done. It actually adds to it. It makes it makes what they did even more impactful to be able to do this with a disability, to understand the nuances of being beaten down by the system. And I, I admire them so much in understanding that thyself and understanding thy own limitations and taking rest as a radical act and, you know, understanding the inner communities of Black Panthers and disabled folks. Like, it's all interconnected, and disabled Black folks are really at the crux of a lot of different things that we forget about that we just choose to ignore. And so those are the people that inspire me the most. I love that. Do you have any beef that you want to like really amplify on this platform? <laughs> I, was... <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> listen, I, listen, I quit my job today. So I oh, don't need to certain... Thank you. I don't need to be starting any beefs in this freelancer life. Hello. Did you try to get me in trouble? How dare you? How dare you? That was a trap. I don't like it. No. I've asked I've asked a few I've only asked that like maybe four or five times, but like sometimes <laughs> I'll ask like these like Fortune fifty executives at the end be like, Do you have any beef? Do you have anything that you'd like to any did you like was anything you like to instigate on this platform? They'd be like and every time they're like, No. And I'm like, Oh, okay, well, it's fine. Uh so uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's so funny seeing the reaction every time. We're like, like, no. I was like, oh, okay, okay. Uh, Just giving you the space if you have, if you so choose. Yours to uh, mine to offer. Yours to reject. Um, okay, uh, Amani, thank you so much for being a guest. Um, we genuinely consider you a friend of the show. Can't wait to have you back for part two. I'll be working with your team. We'll coordinate it and yeah. uh, have a good. Just take care of yourself. Be safe out there. Thank you. I had so much fun talking to you. Um, you're a lovely person. Um, it, you're great to talk to. You. It's really fun. Thank you. Yeah. We'll talk soon. Yeah. Let me know. All right. Peace. Yeah. Thank you. Yo, again, I want to thank Amani for being a guest on the podcast. I love her voice. I love everything that she's doing. Make sure you follow her socials in the links. 
in the show notes. And look, the reality is, is that we don't need any more gestures, statues, streets or uh, murals. We need legislation, resources and advocacy. Every one uh, of these big tech organizations, these companies, they have leverage and voices and reach with governmental agencies to mobilize and sign different pieces of um, documentation to promote legislation to be passed for causes that they believe in. All types of amicus briefs and all different sorts of measures that they use both in front of the scenes and behind the scenes to mobilize impact. And that's what we need. We need effective organizational policies and processes so that we can actually have change. We need coordination between HR departments, diversity and inclusion departments, training departments, and operational teams so that organizationally anti-racism becomes less of a buzzword and more of a way of work. That's what we need. Okay. We need folks to review their budgets, their organizational budgets and hire diversity and inclusion, social justice, activist organizations to help solve the equity issues of black and brown people. That's what we need. It is not sustainable. It is not sustainable. I'm going to say it again. It is not sustainable for black and brown people to continue to be terrorized outside of work and then be subject to incompetence, frankly, oftentimes racist incompetence inside of work. It is not sustainable for your business. You need us. We are the creative uh, lifeblood of all the things that you do in tech. Y'all often are stealing from black folks all the time. Your white papers are sprinkled and littered with black ideas that you then put white faces over. Uh, Your products are typically um, and oftentimes rather, excuse me, um, the result of you taking someone else's ideas. You need us. You need us. It is not sustainable. It is not sustainable for this to continue. It is not. Black life matters. Black life matters. Black careers matter. Black employee experiences matter. Your black customers, they matter. Black people matter. Till next time, this has been Zach. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.